Hi, in this video I am going to show you how to interface a minimal CPU system to a do-it-yourself VGA extension card. If you came here for performance, you are watching the wrong video. But if you want to learn more, let's jump right in and ask what is the absolute minimum required to make a VGA extension work. In the previous episodes of this mini-series, I have already shown how to generate VGA sync signals, send pixel data to a monitor and how timesharing RAM between a VGA circuit and a CPU works. But in the end it felt a bit like cheating since I'd used an Arduino for this, oversimplifying things quite a bit. Since in the meantime I've released this minimal CPU system here and since it does come with an expansion port, I think today it's time for a VGA expansion card. If you haven't already seen my videos about the minimal and its features, go check them out in the links in the description. Let's connect the card to the expansion port. It is a bit of a pain connecting all this with jumper wires. Anyway, let's plug it in the VGA monitor and switch it on. First of all, the picture quality looks strangely dim. That's because the video card outputs random garbage everywhere even during the blanking intervals. Yes, you are hearing correctly, there are no hardware blanking intervals implemented. We need to clear them in the VRAM ourselves. And yes, this might blow your vintage CRT, but my modern monitor looks just a bit irritated. I've written a little VGA demo on the minimal to show the capabilities of the card. Okay, now the blanking intervals are set correctly and it is even displaying some awesome text messages. The system is also capable of plotting single pixels at random positions. The CPU is able to read what pixels are already set at a given byte position, adds a new pixel to it and writes back the byte to its memory location. But honestly, who on earth wants to build this with jumper wires? I mean, it's just three breadboards, but the connections are pretty intense. Let's get rid of all this and replace it with a nice PCB. Now that looks a lot cleaner and works just as well, but we are getting a bit ahead of ourselves. Let us have a look at the schematics and try to break down this design into parts. Mm, forgive me for squeezing everything on a single page here, at least I can say there's no complexity hidden in a subsection. In fact, I've done this to show you that if you've watched my previous videos, you'll be familiar with large parts of the schematic. I've already explained address decoding, VGA sync signal generation and also the pixel data output section. Today let's focus on the interfacing. The VGA card uses the oscillator of the minimal and requires it to be exactly a 16 MHz oscillator. And it also needs the clock divider set to 2 MHz and requires two additional signals from the divider, the full 16 MHz clock and a 4 MHz clock, both of which I connect via jumper wires here. How does video RAM access look like from the minimals perspective? The VGA card has a 16-bit VRAM address register and an 8-bit data register which are memory mapped to the address space hexdff8 to hexdfff. Memory line M2 activates the data register and M1 and M0 activate the MSB and LSB of the address register respectively. If we want to access video RAM location, let's say hex 0811, the CPU would execute load immediate 11, store at address dff9, load immediate 8, store at address DFFA, load immediate FF, store at address DFFC. And if we increment our address register, we can store data at the next location in video RAM. Here is the video RAM layout. We have 64 bytes per row, of which 50 bytes may hold pixel data, yielding a maximum horizontal resolution of 400 pixels. Since we haven't hardwired any blanking intervals, we can choose and position our pixel area to our liking within the yellow limits. In my test code, I've chosen 320 times 200 pixels, with the top left byte being at address 0811. We can also use the boot monitor to read and write our video RAM manually. Let's see how that goes. Let me set the address register first 
and now we can write something to that VRAM location. And there it is! Did you see it? Let's also set the next byte. And reading back from video RAM also works fine. Let us dive into the schematic now. Detecting whether the VGA memory range is hit just uses a couple of end gates and inverters. If our data register is activated via memory line M2, we better disable the CPU memory by pulling this inhibit line low. Down here we see that the bus data is latched into this LSB address register if the control signal RAM in of the CPU is active low and at the same time VGA range and memory address line 0 are both high, as it is with address DFF9. The same is true for the MSB part if M1 is active. Let us take a look at what happens with the data at the Q outputs. They directly connect to the address lines of the video RAM here, but so do the outputs of these buffers up here. They buffer the counter address of the video RAM data that is currently being sent to the monitor. There looks like an address bus conflict, but here comes bus sharing into play. As you can see, the outputs of these ICs are switched by this TVRAM signal. If TVRAM is low, the counter provides the VRAM address. And if TVRAM is high or not TVRAM is low, the address register provides the RAM address. Let us take a closer look at TVRAM. Here you see a full clock cycle and the 2 MHz and 4 MHz signals. TVRAM is just the logical OR of these two signals. It is low only during the first quarter of the clock cycle. During that time the VGA counter makes the VRAM output the next data byte to be displayed. And at the end of this first quarter the parallel load pulse PL happens, loading the pixel data into this shift register for transmission to the monitor. During the remaining three quarters of the clock cycle, the VRAM exposes the memory location the address register is pointing to. Now we are ready to take a look at the read-write circuit. In case a write to hex DFFC happens, both inhibit and RAM in will be low. This in turn will activate a write pulse during the second half of the clock. The VRAM will store whatever is present at its data inputs. This data comes from the data bus, of course. For a write operation, the RAM out control signal will be inactive low, so this buffer sends data present at B over to its A outputs, effectively connecting our data bus to the VRAM input. In case of a read operation, RAM out will be active and the buffer will work the other way around. Data from the VRAM's output will be put onto the bus. Of course, this buffer must only be active during the VRAM time slot and only if we are accessing the VGA data register at hex DFFC with a read or write operation. That is the purpose of the remaining three gates here on the left. Whew! If you have made it with me so far, congratulations! I hope you like this totally stripped down design. I am well aware of its limitations, as I am sure you are too. Again, be careful connecting it to a real CRT. Please leave your thoughts down in the comments and consider subscribing if you think I've earned it. As always, the link to this project is down in the description. Take care. Bye.